Well, as you can see, we're continuing on in our First Timothy series, so you can ready your Bibles there in First uh, Timothy chapter 3. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 13 this morning. As you're turning there, I just want to remind you a little bit of where we've been. Uh, so Paul has entered into uh, the portion of his letter beginning in chapter 2 where he is giving Timothy instructions for how the worship service ought to function. Uh, and last week, Keith showed us how Paul addresses uh, differences in gender roles in the worship service. He showed how men ought to be engaged in the service through holy prayer, uh, among other things. And he also showed us how women ought to dress themselves in a way that accords with godliness and how they also ought to submit to the authority and teaching of the qualified men in the church. And with Paul laying out these expectations and establishing them, now in chapter 3, he turns to address the two official offices of the church and what qualifications are required in order to hold them. So I'm going to read verses 1 through 13 for us of First Timothy chapter 3. You can follow along. The saying is trustworthy, if anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must, be, he must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders, so that he may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil." Deacons, likewise, must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience, and let them also be tested first, then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. Their wives, likewise, must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things." Let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children and their own households well. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. Well, as we begin to unfold this text this morning, I want to begin by defining some of the basics of the office of overseer and deacon. Paul introduces us to these two offices in verse 1 and in verse 8, uh, and before we get into the qualifications of these offices, I want to talk a little bit more about them, uh, what they're supposed to be doing, how they function in the church to give us a better idea of what these offices are about. So let's start with this office of overseer. And when you read verse 1 and, and you see this office of overseer, uh, you may not immediately know what it's talking about. Um, different denominations and churches will label their leadership offices differently for a variety of reasons, and there's a good chance that you have never been in a church that has an office of overseer. Um, and what I want us to see here is the diverse way in which Scripture speaks about the office of overseer. So this office is spoken of elsewhere in Scripture as the elders of the church and as the pastors and shepherds of the church. Uh, 1 Peter 5, 1 through 3 shows us how each of these terms are used synonymously to describe the same role or office in the church. Listen to what he says. He says, So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, 
not for shameful gain, but eagerly. So we see here that Peter uses these three descriptions interchangeably of to oversee or to give oversight, uh, to be an elder, to be a shepherd or pastor. Um, He's using these terms interchangeably to describe the same office in the church, the office that Paul is describing here as the office of overseer. So when you are reading Scripture and come across the elders of the church or pastors and shepherds or the overseers, uh, understand that Scripture is speaking about one role here. This is not three different roles. This is one role, the office of overseer, elder, pastor, shepherd, okay? Now, the reason Scripture uses different titles to define the same office is because the different descriptions help us understand how those in this role are to function, what they are to do. Each of these different names give fuller meaning to the role that these men are to play. So, what are they to do? What, is the, what are those in the office of overseer, elder, pastor supposed to do? How do they function? Well, they function first in exercising spiritual authority through the oversight and direction of the church at large and of pastoring the members of the church in a more personal, individual capacity. Uh, If you break down these two categories, they would include a teaching role and a personal discipleship care role. So broadly speaking, Uh, When we consider this office of overseer, those who serve in this office should be involved in the following in some capacity. They should be giving spiritual oversight to the teaching of the church. They should be participating in teaching the word in various settings and capacities. They should be involved in the overall spiritual discipleship of the church. And they should be involved in the personal spiritual leadership of the members of the church. This is the the function or the role that the overseer, pastor, shepherd is to play in the congregation. Now, how does the office of overseer, how is it fulfilled here at Farallon? When you look at our leadership structure, um, the office of overseer is fulfilled through our leadership team. Um, Our leadership team is comprised of four lay elders, unpaid elders, and of multiple paid pastors. Now understand the difference between pastor and elder, we're talking about the same office of overseer. The way we distinguish those is that elders are unpaid and pastors are paid to do the work of ministry. But together we are both fulfilling this office of overseer that we see here in 1 Timothy. So this is important for when we come to considering the qualifications For the office of overseer in a minute, when we come to those qualifications, you ought to be thinking about the pastors and elders of the church. The qualifications apply to them, to us. The second office that Paul introduces us to is the office of deacon in verse 8. And the basic meaning of the word deacon is one who serves or a servant And when we are considering the office of deacon, we are considering those who have been appointed by the elders of the church to serve the church in different official capacities. Now, these individuals, these deacons, do not carry the spiritual authority and responsibility that those in the office of overseer do. Um, Instead, the office of deacon is meant to be a supportive role to the elders and pastors, aiding them in the work of ministry uh, that they can't do by themselves. So the office of deacon is not a role of spiritual authority and leadership, but one of humble service to the body of Christ, serving and leading different ministries and in helping meet tangible needs in the church. So when we think about how a deacon is to function in relation to the overseer role, uh, Acts 6 verses 1 through 6 is very helpful to us. This is what Luke says there. He says, Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, 
It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will be devoted to prayer and to the ministry of the word. So what we see here is likely the early emergence of this office of deacon being differentiated from the office of overseer. Uh, As the early church began to grow, it became obvious that the apostles were unable to meet all of the needs that were arising in the church. Uh, We see that when some of the Hellenistic widows were being neglected in the daily distribution uh, as their needs were being met in that way. Uh, They were being neglected. There wasn't enough leaders to do the work of getting everything done. They were being stretched too thin, and as a result, these needs were not being met. Um, Now, not only were the needs not being met, but the apostles were being pulled away from their primary role and calling of preaching and prayer. And so they decided to fix this problem by assigning servants or deacons who would help with the more service-related needs of the church. So in this passage, we see here the early emergence of this office of deacon and of this role of overseer and how they differ. The apostles determined our job is to be praying and preaching, and we want somebody else to carry out the tangible ministry needs of the church, handling the daily distribution and the other ministry ministries that they had. And so they assigned others to take care of that role so that they could keep preaching and being in prayer and so that the needs of the church could continue to be met, that they did not see themselves being responsible for. So uh, this helps us see a little bit more the way overseers and deacons are to function together. Overseers are the ones exercising spiritual authority, guarding the teaching, teaching people in various capacities, pastoring people, shepherding people, walking with people, and deacons are to be helping the elders continue to do that by meeting the other practical needs in the church. Now, how is the office of deacon fulfilled at Fairlawn? Well, at this point, uh, Fairlawn does not have the office of deacon, and I asked our church historian, who is Dwayne, if you didn't know that, Uh, He said that to his knowledge, Fairlawn Mennonite Church has never had the office of deacon. Now, we have team leaders and directors that serve the church in different capacities, but we do not currently see them as being synonymous with this office of deacon referenced here in Scripture. Now, in light of this, uh, some questions that came to my mind as I was preparing for this sermon and questions that you may be thinking um, are, well... Should we have an office of deacon here at Fairlawn? I mean, Paul says that there are deacons in the church or there should be deacons in the church, so should we have deacons here at Fairlawn? Um, If we were to have deacons here at Fairlawn, um, what would that office look like in light of our structure with team leaders and directors? Uh, These are good and appropriate questions to ask based on what we're seeing here in the text and based on the structure of our church And these are questions that we as a leadership team are considering. I want to reiterate something that Keith said previously in this series. He said that we wanted this study through 1 Timothy to challenge us as a church and to refine our beliefs and practices so that we can more faithfully and consistently protect and promote the gospel as a church. And so we wanted this to be a test for us as we walk through this book, not just as individual Christians, but as a church as a whole. Are we operating in our worship services and our structure and the way that we do things as a church in accordance with God's word? No church is perfect. No Christian is perfect. We're all in the process of conforming more and more to God's word. And we see areas where we probably need to grow as a church as well. And so as a leadership team, Uh, We intend to process more our current structure and this office of deacon to ensure that we are fulfilling what the scriptures are prescribing for us here. So in defining the office of overseer, we have seen that overseers are in a position of spiritual authority 
and are to give oversight and guidance and leadership to the church at large and its individual members. And then regarding deacons, we have seen that they are appointed by the elders to serve the church in an official role that does not include the exercise of spiritual authority. They are to serve and meet the needs of the church that the elders assign to them. Now let's turn and consider the qualifications for these two offices. Uh, The qualifications are listed in verses 2 through 13 for both the office of overseer and deacon. And what I want to do is just walk through each one of these. Uh, There's 14 qualifications for the office of overseer and then a couple extra that don't overlap for the office of deacon. So needless to say, I cannot spend a whole lot of time defining what all these things mean. Uh, I'm going to tell you what the the qualification is. I'm going to give you a brief description of it um, to help you understand it a little bit more. Um, And then if you would like to study more on your own time, you can. Uh, And then as we go throughout here, um, I'm going to let you know when the requirement that's given here is for both overseer and deacon. And then at the end, I'll handle the two uh, that don't overlap that are just for the uh, deacon office. So jumping in here, in verse 2, we start to see the um, requirements for the office of overseer. And it says that the one who serves in the office of overseer must firstly be above reproach. To be above reproach is to be recognized as having positive moral character, uh, being a person of moral integrity. And this moral integrity should be observable to the church community that these men are a part of. You should be able to see this moral integrity in the way that they live their lives. Secondly, uh, this is a qualification for both deacons and uh, for overseers. It says they must be the husband of one wife. Now, a literal translation of what what these words here in the Greek to English is that these people must be one woman men is the way that it's literally translated. Um, We don't have time to survey all of the possibilities of the way this could be understood. There's about four primary ways uh, that this phrase here is understood and what Paul is actually requiring of these two offices. Um, But I think that Paul is most likely requiring overseers and deacons to be faithful to their spouses if they are married a one-woman man, and sexually pure if they are not married. So again, there's multiple ways to understand this. I think that this way gives the best understanding of what we see in Scripture as a whole. And so if this is right, uh, if what I'm saying here is correct, that Paul is saying that they must be faithful if they are married to their spouses, and if they're not married, they must be sexually pure, um then what Paul would be saying is that those who are married and not living with moral purity in their marriages would be disqualified from serving in the office of overseer or deacon. Likewise, those who are not married and are living in sexual impurity would also be disqualified from serving in these offices. Thirdly, the overseer must be sober-minded To be sober-minded is to be thoughtful and not reckless in one's thinking and processing. Uh, They are not prone to rash decisions, but give careful thought to the choices that they make. Fourth, they must be self-controlled. Someone who is self-controlled is someone who is not mastered by anything, someone who is not addicted to or controlled by anyone or anything. Fifth, they must be respectable. And this is also required of deacons. Uh, Someone who is respectable is someone who has admirable characteristics. Somebody that you look at and that you admire. Sixthly, uh, the overseer must be hospitable. To be hospitable is to be kind and welcoming in your demeanor towards others. And seven, the overseer must be able to teach. Now, this is a requirement only for the overseer office in part uh, because it is one of the ways that the elders uniquely exercise their spiritual authority and guidance over the church. It's not a requirement for deacons because 
Deacons are not expected to be teaching the congregation. They're not expected to be exercising spiritual authority through the exercise of teaching and instructing in the Word of God. That is why uh, Paul restricts this qualification to the elders or the overseers of the church. Now, we should not understand able to teach as being synonymous with able to preach. Uh, Preaching is one way that the elders and pastors of the church are to be exercising their spiritual authority through preaching. Uh, But being able to teach expands beyond just a monologue on a Sunday morning. Uh, Being able to teach is having the ability to guide and instruct others in the basics of the Christian faith from the Word of God in various settings, in one-to-one conversations, in small group settings, in a preaching setting. It's more generally to have this ability to guide and instruct people from the Word of God. Eight, and this is a a requirement for both overseers and deacons, they are not to be drunkards. Anyone serving in the office of overseer or deacon must not be controlled by alcohol. Uh, They must be ones who exercise appropriate moderation regarding alcoholic drinks. Nine, overseers must not be violent but gentle. They must not be ruled by an emotion of anger. They must be gentle in demeanor and able to control their emotions. Ten, they must not be quarrelsome. Someone who is not quarrelsome is someone who aims for peace in relationships and is not striving to stir up unnecessary conflict. Eleven, both of overseers and deacons, they must not be a lover of money. Those who serve in these offices are required to not be ruled by a desire for wealth or material possessions. Uh, This does not mean that Uh, A pastor or deacon can not have wealth or material possessions, but that they must not be dominated by a desire to attain those things. Twelve, again, required of both overseers and deacons, they must manage their own households well. They must be faithful leaders in their homes. Uh, When speaking about overseers, Paul gives a direct comparison between how an overseer leads in the church and how they lead at home. Uh, He's making the connection here that how one leads his family is a direct indication of their ability to lead in the church. Thirteen, those who are overseers must not be recent converts. Now there's no time frame that Paul gives post-conversion before one can be considered for the office of, de- or of overseer, um, but I believe that Paul's point here is similar to the one he makes about deacons in verse 10, where he requires a time of testing before someone is placed in the office of deacon. I think that Paul, what Paul is getting at here is that he doesn't want immature, unproven people put in positions of leadership, either as an overseer or as a deacon in the church. He wants those who are spiritually mature to be put in these roles. 14, the overseer must be well thought of by outsiders. He must be respected by those outside of the church. This speaks to Paul's concern for the image of the church in the watching world, in the eyes of the watching world. If the leaders of the church are of dishonorable reputation among the community, so too will the message of the gospel be that they proclaim. So those who are preaching and teaching and leading the church and giving spiritual oversight and guidance, if they are not of reputable reputation, of honorable reputation, the message of the gospel is going to be maligned by their lives. So they must be well thought of by outsiders. So that comprises the list of what is required partially of deacons and fully of what is required of the office of overseer, pastor, elder. Uh, Now there are two qualifications that are given only to deacons and one encouragement that Paul gives to serving in the office of deacon. In verse 8, Paul says that the deacon must not be double-tongued. 
To be double-tongued is to be deceptive in your speech, to intentionally mislead people with your words. Uh, Deacons must be pure and honest in their speech. And in verse 9, Paul says that deacons must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. Now, what's most likely in view here when Paul says the mystery of the faith is he's probably speaking about the, the basics of the gospel message. Deacons are to be convinced of the truths of the gospel and hold to them unswervingly. And the reason for this is because you don't want somebody serving in an official capacity in the church who is not fully convinced of the message of the gospel. You don't want to have that uh, reality of somebody not being solid in that role. And should they turn away from the gospel at one point um, to have the church and its image maligned in the eyes of the community uh, by having a leader in that way turn away from the truths of the gospel. So deacons must hold to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. And then in verse 13, Paul gives his encouragement to serve in this office. He says, For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. So Paul encourages those who serve as deacons by telling them that their faithful service will be recognized by those in the church And not only this, but through their service, God will increase their faith and their confidence in Christ. Okay. (laughs) The last thing that we need to consider here in the qualification section is if there are any, any gender qualifications for serving in these two roles, the role of overseer and deacon. So last week, uh, Paul showed us that the office of overseer, elder, pastor is restricted to qualified men because this role is one that involves exercising authority over the church and teaching the church at large. Uh, In order to maintain God's design for gender roles and authority, Paul restricts women from exercising authority over men, which means they cannot occupy the office of overseer, elder, or pastor because that is a key part of what is required of those who serve in that role. If that's not enough explanation for you, you can see Keith's sermon from last week where he spent the whole sermon talking about that. So we would see here at Fairlawn the office of overseer, pastor, elder to be restricted to Men who meet the qualifications laid out in this chapter. The question remains then, what about the office of deacon? Is it also restricted to men or is it open to women as well? The way anyone answers this question will depend largely on how they understand what Paul says in verse 11 of this passage. I want to read to you two different translations, the ESV, which we've already read, and the NIV. The way in which they translate from the original Greek gives us an obvious understanding of the two different opinions or views on this. So the ESV translates verse 11 this way, their wives likewise, speaking about the wives of deacons, must be dignified not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. And then the NIV translates it this way. In the same way, the women are to be worthy of respect, not malicious talkers, but temperate and trustworthy in everything. So the difference between these two translations reveals the question at hand. Is Paul referencing here the wives of deacons, of deacons who are men who are serving in the office of deacon, but he's putting a requirement on their wives as well? Or is it referencing women who also occupy the office of deacon, both men and women individually occupying this office? So this, these are the two primary views of this passage. One would say that this is referencing the wives of deacons, giving qualifications for them, uh, because 
Um, deacons serve in a different capacity than elders and pastors do, and so their wives are going to be more a part of that ministry. So Paul sees fit to put some qualifications on their wives as well. And then the other position is, no, this isn't talking about deacons' wives. This is talking about women who also occupy the office of deacon. Now, I will say that this question uh, demands and deserves more time than I am able to give it in the next five minutes and 56 seconds. Um, But when I consider this, uh, the argumentation for both of these positions, uh, I find the evidence compelling on both sides. Uh, There's a lot of good reason to take it one way or the other um, and to believe one or the other. Now, I personally uh, have not done enough study in seeking the Lord to form a strong personal conviction one way or the other regarding this question. Um, And so I don't really have something to present to you (laughs) as what I think is the appropriate way to go here. Um, And because of our structure as a church, uh, because we don't currently have the office of deacon, we have not gone through the process of answering this question as a leadership team. We've not gone through the intense process of study and prayer and seeking the Lord that is necessary to come to a decision on on what we believe as a church relating to this question. Uh, But should this office of deacon become a part of our structure in the future, um, this will be part of our process of looking at what the text says here and what the New Testament and the scriptures say as a whole and determining whether women serve in this office or whether this is a qualification for the wives of deacons who are um, serving as men in this role. Now, for those of you who are interested in uh, the detailed argumentation for each position, you want to do some more study on your own, um, you can let me know and I can give you some resources to look at. Um, Keith said last week uh, that he opened up a bunch of cans of beans and left them out on the counter. Um, I just decided to open one of my own uh, and leave it there for your own personal study at this point. So let's, let's draw what we've seen here to a close. We've seen um, both what the office of overseer and deacon are, how they are different from one another, and what the qualifications are uh, to serve in these two roles. I want to bring this to a close by considering why these qualifications are important, not only for Timothy in the church in Ephesus, but for us as well. When we think about this why question, what immediately comes to mind is the situation Timothy was in in Ephesus. Ephesus was filled with unqualified leaders who were distracting the church from the message of the gospel in both their belief in both what they were teaching and in their practice, in the way in which they lived their lives as leaders. So Paul includes this list of qualifications so that Timothy is clear on what kind of leaders he needs to establish in the church after he removes all of these unqualified leaders. And as we consider our context, these qualifications are just as important for us as they were for Timothy in the church in Ephesus. Elders and pastors have the ability and responsibility to lead and shape the church. They have a high degree of influence. And if their beliefs and lives are not firmly rooted in the scriptures, the church can easily drift from protecting and promoting the gospel. And so this entire series has been talking about Paul's concern for the church to be protecting and promoting the gospel. One of the ways that we protect and promote the gospel is through protecting the role of overseer, pastor, this office, is protecting it from unqualified people serving in it. That's one of the ways that we protect and promote the gospel here at Fairlawn. And the members of the church play an essential role in helping to make sure that those serving in the office of elder or pastor meet the qualifications described in this chapter. This is why you vote on incoming pastors. This is why we ask for your affirmation when a new elder comes on. 
This is an essential responsibility that the members of the church play in protecting and promoting the gospel. We protect the gospel by protecting the office of elder pastor from those who are not qualified to serve in it, and we promote the gospel by affirming those to be in this office who in belief and practice live according to the gospel. And if we are not living and teaching and believing in accordance with the gospel of Jesus Christ, we have no business serving as your elders and pastors. But this is not something that we are just responsible for in and of ourselves. This is a responsibility that lays on the members of the church to be about protecting who serves in these offices, specifically the office of elder pastor. So brothers and sisters, my encouragement and exhortation to you is to take what Paul says here in these qualifications and put it to use in protecting and promoting the gospel by ensuring that the elders and pastors that are put into positions of authority here are fulfilling the qualifications of the office that we serve in, the qualifications given here in 1 Timothy 3. This should be at the forefront of your mind, what Paul says here, when you're voting on new pastors, when you're affirming new elders as they come in. These qualifications should be on your mind. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your grace and mercy to us in giving us this list of offices and qualifications for them so that those who serve in positions of official representation in your church would be ones who in belief and practice are promoting and protecting the gospel of Jesus Christ and leading the church to do the same. Give us grace as we bring in new pastors, as we affirm new elders, to affirm and approve those who are qualified to be in those positions, and that as we do so, they may serve in a way that is in keeping with the gospel of Jesus Christ, that the church may be built up and that the gospel may be proclaimed and protected in our church and in our community. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.